So this is going to be a short video in which we're going to formally define the two types of improper integral. So the first type is integrating to infinity. So let's consider a function f that's defined on a region from the point a all the way up to infinity, so it's unbounded in the rightward direction, and it's a real valued function. So this might be a picture of such a function. So here is our point A, and then our domain goes on in this direction forever. And then it's being mapped onto a real value, and this is that function being plotted here. And you can see that it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller, closer and closer to zero as you go on forever. And now what we want to do is consider defining something like this, the integral from A to infinity of f of x dx. Is it possible to make sense of this? Well, the answer is yes. What we can consider doing is defining a function that I'll call i of x, i for integral. And this is also going to be a function defined on this same domain, so from a all the way onwards. And it's going to be a real valued function, and it's going to be defined like so. So we will integrate the initial function f from a up until the point x. And we'll need, of course, for this function to be defined, all of these integrals to exist. So if you take a point x here, let's say, if you want to know what i of x is going to be there, you need to integrate the initial function here from a up until that point x. So if for all the points in this domain, this integral is defined, if you put that x value up here, then this function i will be defined for all the points in this domain, and of course it will be a real valued function. Now for many functions f that you could consider here, if you construct this function i of x, it's just going to start at zero for a, and then it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's probably going to be unbounded. However, in the case of some functions f, it might be the case that this function i of x as you get bigger and bigger, actually approaches some value, i.e. that this function actually has a limit as x approaches infinity. And those functions, f, for which that occurs, are going to be the ones where the integral from a to infinity is actually something sensible that we can define. So I've illustrated this with the picture here. So let's imagine that our function in white here is one of these functions for which i of x has a limit as x approaches infinity. I've drawn on, in red here, the function i of x, or what the function i of x might look like. So you can see that at a, i of x is equal to 0, and then it gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but as you get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger approaching infinity, it is getting and staying indefinitely close to some value, uh, which is this limit that I've called l here, and that's the limit as x approaches infinity of i of x. So that then is the definition for the first type of improper integral. The integral from a to infinity of f of t dt is equal to the limit as x approaches infinity of the integral from a to x of f of t dt if this limit is actually something finite. Of course, if this function i of x here gets unbounded either in the positive direction or in the negative direction, then this limit isn't going to be something finite, and therefore we wouldn't say that this improper integral exists. But if that limit is something finite, then you can define the integral from a to infinity of f of t dt. But it's known as an improper integral to distinguish the fact that its definition is separate from the definition of a normal integral, where the upper and lower bound are both finite real numbers. So let's now move on and talk about the second type of improper integral. So in the first type, we were considering when is it sensible to actually define what it means to integrate to infinity. So the domain was going to be unbounded. In the second type, we're going to think about when is it sensible to define what it means to integrate an unbounded function over some bounded interval. So the domain is going to be bounded now, but the codomain is going to be unbounded in this case. And this is the sort of picture of what we're considering now, so functions with asymptotes that are unbounded either in the positive direction or the negative direction. So we've got some function defined over the interval a, b, and note that the interval includes its lower bound but not its upper bound, b, because we're imagining that the asymptote is going to be at the point b. And it's going to be a real-valued function. 
and the picture that I've drawn here has the function being unbounded in the positive direction, but you could consider an example of the function being unbounded in the negative direction, going off to negative infinity as you approach b. So we want to think about when is it the case that it's sensible to define the notion of the integral from a to b of f of t dt. Now, the Riemann integral, the normal notion of the Riemann integral, is not going to exist for this function, and there's two reasons for that, one of them more trivial than the other. The first problem is that the function isn't actually defined at the point b, and if we're going to integrate from a to b, we do need it to be defined everywhere over the closed interval a, b. Now, we could fix that very easily. We could just say at b, we're going to define the function to be zero, so that problem can go away. The bigger problem is that the function is actually unbounded over the interval a, b. And in the case of the picture that I've drawn, it's unbounded in the positive direction, but you could consider it being unbounded in the negative direction. And why is that a problem? Well, unbounded functions are not Riemann integrable, and the reason is that the Riemann sums, the upper and lower Riemann sums, if it's unbounded in the positive direction, the upper Riemann sums aren't going to be defined for any dissection. And if it's unbounded in the lower direction, the lower Riemann sums aren't going to be defined in any direction, or for any dissection, rather. So let's illustrate this with our picture here. So our picture is a function that's unbounded in the positive direction, and therefore it's going to have problems with the upper Riemann sums. And let's see why this is the case. So I've got my dissection here of the interval. I've made these cuts here. This is my dissection D. And let's think about trying to work out the upper Riemann sum for our function over this dissection. So we'll have absolutely no problems with these three subintervals. We can take their lengths and multiply them by the supremum of the function over each one of those subintervals. That's going to be absolutely fine. It's this one that we're going to have problems with. Now we've fixed the problem of the function not being defined at b. We've said we're going to say that the function is zero there, so that's not a problem anymore. The problem is that the function doesn't have a supremum over that subinterval. It's unbounded over that subinterval. So we're stuck. We can't actually work out that component of the sum, and therefore overall the whole sum isn't defined. And you're going to have the same problem with finding the upper Riemann sum, no matter what dissection you pick. Whatever dissection you pick, it's going to have to be the case that over one of the subintervals, the function is unbounded. Because if it were the case that it was bounded over every single one of the subintervals of your dissection, then it would be the case that the function was bounded over the entire interval, which we know it isn't. So it must be the case for whatever dissection you pick that you're going to have this same problem that over one of the subintervals the function is going to be unbounded and therefore the supremum is not going to exist. Therefore you cannot calculate the bit of the upper Riemann sum that comes from that subinterval and therefore the whole upper Riemann sum isn't defined. Now just to also point out that in the case of this function that's unbounded above, it's just the upper Riemann sums that have problems. The lower Riemann sums are absolutely fine. So if we consider this dissection I've got drawn here, this subinterval is going to be fine if we're talking about lower Riemann sum because its infimum is going to be defined. Now you might think the infimum's around there probably, but actually we said that we were going to define the function to be zero at b, so the infimum would end up being zero. But the point is the infimum is going to exist and therefore you're not going to have any problems with defining the lower Riemann sums. In contrast, I've drawn here a function that is unbounded below, so is unbounded in the negative direction. And in contrast, this one, the upper Riemann sums are going to be fine, and it's the lower Riemann sums that are going to have problems. So you can see that if we use this same dissection, obviously all these first three subintervals are going to be fine, so just look at this one. Well, the supremum of the function over that subinterval is going to be absolutely fine. It's either going to be this value or because we've said that at b it's going to be zero, it will actually end up being zero there. So we're going to be absolutely fine finding an upper Riemann sum for this function, but then try and find its lower Riemann sum. Again, it's absolutely fine over these three subintervals, but here, what is the infimum of the function here? Well, actually, it's unbounded below, so it doesn't have an infimum, and therefore the lower Riemann sums fail in this example. So the overall point is that whether the function is unbounded above or unbounded below, the Riemann integral definition is going to fail because either the upper Riemann sums or the lower Riemann sums are not going to be defined for all dissections. So the normal Riemann integral for this function is not defined. 
So the case then, when it is sensible to define this separately as an improper integral, is again when the limit of the integral as you approach b exists. So again, what we can consider doing is defining a function which we'll call i for integral, and it's going to be a function on the interval a, b, and it's going to be a real valued function, and the way it's going to be defined is if you take any x inside this interval, it will map it onto the value of the integral from a to x of f of t dt. So if we take, for instance, this point as our x value, i of x is going to be the integral of our function f from a up until that value x. So we need it to be the case that this integral exists for all x inside this interval. And note, x is less than b, strictly less than b. So we're not trying to integrate it from a to b. We're trying to integrate it from a up until a point x. And if it's the case that that integral exists for all the x's that are to the left of b, then it might be the case that defining this is possible. So if this function i is defined for all the points in this interval, then we can ask what happens as you get closer and closer to b. Now it might be the case that the function actually also is unbounded either in the positive direction or the negative direction. So in the case of our function here f that's unbounded in the positive direction, our i function might also get bigger and bigger and bigger as you get closer and closer to b and also be unbounded. However, if it is the case that that i function actually doesn't get unbounded and actually as you approach b gets closer and closer to some value, so has a limit as x approaches b, then that's the situation where it is sensible to actually define an improper integral notion of the integral from a to b of f of t dt. So if the limit as x approaches b of the integral from a to x f of t dt exists, then we will define that value to be the improper integral of f of t from a to b. So illustrating this on the picture here, so let's imagine that our function in white, our f function, is one of these functions for which the integrals approach some finite value as you get closer and closer to b. Then what I've plotted in red here is what our i function might look like. So again, it starts at zero um, when x is equal to a, and then gets bigger and bigger, and then as you get closer and closer to b, instead of going off and getting undefinitely big, instead it's actually approaching some finite value, this value here, and that is the limit as x approaches b of these integrals. So that's the second type of improper integral then, when you want to define a notion of the integral of an unbounded function, then it is sensible to do so if the limit of the integrals as you approach the end where the unboundedness occurs, where the asymptote is, if that limit exists, then it's sensible to define that value as the integral of the function. Now in our example, we've looked at the case where the asymptote is at the upper bound of the interval, but the idea works just as well if the asymptote is at the lower end of the interval. Again, you just think about taking integrals where the lower bound is closer and closer to this value a, and then just taking the limit of them as your lower bound approaches a. And if that limit exists, then you define that value to be the value of the improper integral.